Chopin, the great melodist. He's always good for a bel canto tune or Polish dance rhythm, isn't he? It's safe to say that the last movement of Chopin's second sonata shows us a different side to the composer, one not always fully appreciated. In addition to his well-known lyrical gifts, he was also a great innovator, especially when it came to harmony. Be it the opulent coda of his Barcarral, or the pervading chromaticism of his final mazurka, it was Chopin's inventions which helped map the harmonic terrain for future generations of composers. Of all his works, though, the finale of the second sonata stands out as being particularly forward-looking. After three more or less conventional movements, a sonata form, a scherzo, and a certain funeral march, this final fourth movement comes across as a bit of a shock. A single line, played by both hands an octave apart, hurtles breathlessly up and down the keyboard for the movement's entire short duration. With no tempo, textural, or dynamic variability, the music seems to blur into a single undifferentiated tangle of notes. The work's themes, architecture, and tonality are rendered hidden, which led Ligeti to claim that this was probably the first atonal piece in the history of music. That's quite the claim. Could this really be atonal? Well, surely not in the 12-tone row sense of the word. We are in a key, B-flat minor, it's just that it's often quite hard to tell. At the beginning, for example, we're completely adrift, with a first theme, if you can call it that, based on unstable, half-diminished and diminished seventh chords. We quickly arrive at the tonic, but just as quickly move on from it, and you'd be forgiven for missing it entirely considering the abundance of passing and chromatic notes which dilute this all-important chord. Soon after, we have passages like this, formed of chromatically descending triads. Now, chromaticism is hardly rare in romantic piano music. What is rather rare, however, is to have a chromatic line where every other note is dislodged from its usual position and shunted down the octave. Such a line is woven through this angular passage, yielding some immensely dissonant intervals on strong beats of the bar. Again, you'd be forgiven for losing the tonal thread here if we ever grasped it in the first place. Another reason why it's so hard to detect a prevailing tonality is simply that there's no vertical harmony. In so much of Chopin's music, the left hand is assigned the role of accompanist and provides chordal support for the right hand. As a result, no matter how complicated a certain right hand line might get, it's usually always clear how it fits within the broader harmonic context. But as we know with this finale, both hands play the same single line of music. We lack any sort of accompaniment which explicitly spells out the chords for us, and instead must follow harmonic progressions that are articulated horizontally over the course of several notes. This isn't such a problem when the music's formed of broken chords, but when it's formed of scales, which it very often is, it once again becomes tonally disorientated. Take this hair-raising sequence as an example littered with dreaded double flats. With precious few broken chords to go on, it's only through highlighting certain notes within the scales, emphasised either by metre or contour, that we can begin to uncover the harmonic scaffold. Whether you can hear this scaffold in performance is a question we'll get onto in a moment. Regardless, it seems to indicate a modulation to the relative major, D flat. Initially in diminished seventh territory, the music passes through the Neapolitan, then, after the briefest and most tenuous of dominant preparations, we arrive in D-flat for the work's second theme. Right, now back to the question of whether we can actually hear any of the underlying harmonic framework, because this is central, I think, to what Ligeti meant when he described the piece as atonal. Well, a lot of it comes down to the performer for the choice of tempo, dynamic, articulation, and pedal will all profoundly impact the level of detail a listener can pick up. Play it more slowly, and the fog dissipates, revealing harmony but also melodic fragments that were hitherto concealed. So 
those who've analysed the piece may feel confident that they can hear the harmonic framework. Personally, I think I can, at least more than I used to. Bear in mind, though, that analysis can dramatically colour the listening experience. When I listen, it's possible that I'm filling in the gaps, perceiving a more harmonically coherent piece than is actually resonating from the piano strings. This work might best be described, then, as theoretically tonal, but experientially atonal. Or maybe I'm just overthinking it. Anyway, I'd love to hear what you think in the comments. How does analysis inform or distort your listening? And is a piece coherent even if you can't hear that coherence? If you enjoyed the video, be sure to subscribe. I'd love to build a little community here and connect with like-minded people. Thanks, and see you soon.